Hello again, and welcome back to day three of the teaching on race, racism, and anti-racism. I'm Michelle Lloyd Page, and it is my pleasure to serve as the executive associate to the president for diversity and inclusion here at Calvin University. Today, our guest is Dr. Sarah Visser. Um, Sarah Visser is a Calvin alum, and she received her PhD from Claremont Graduate University. Her studies focused on higher education and administration, diversity and change, and on exploring how institutions build capacity in the area of diversity. You can see why we wanted to have her as a part of our teaching this year. She has a passion for engaging scholarship and praxis related to social justice issues with specializations in gender studies, organizational culture, and identity development, class consciousness, and white privilege. Dr. Visser began her role at Calvin University as a vice president for student life in July 2015. Seems like just yesterday. I have had the privilege of serving with her president's cabinet and council and a number of other committees. Um, and before COVID, it would, we would always find ourselves sitting next to each other, even if we hadn't planned to, right? I would go in, I put my stuff down and I'd come back and she's sitting there or, or vice versa. It is fun sitting with her in those meetings. It is fun meeting with her one on one, um, gaining some insights, sharing um, concerns, sharing ideas about how to move this campus closer to the vision that has been cast for being an anti racist campus. I'm so delighted that she is here with us today. She has become a cherished friend and an ally in my work. And I'm looking forward to hearing her presentation today on whiteness and the Christian Academy. I believe it is a timely discussion. Um, and as she started, I will be putting a link to the talkback session in the chat so that we all have the same link if we want to show up at five o'clock. So please welcome Dr. Sarah Visser. Well, thank you so much. Hopefully you can all see my slides as we get going here. Um, it is a real pleasure um, to be joining you for the teaching. And, and I want to say too that I've really appreciated um, taking part in the last couple of days, those sessions. Um, it's been a blessing to learn from scholars that are right here in the midst of our Kelvin community. And both of those sessions I found to be not only informative, but also inspiring um, and motivating. So I'm humbled, I'm grateful for this opportunity. And um, the, the topic that I'm going to talk about today, and actually the presentation that I'll share, um, I first shared about a year ago at a plenary session for a diversity conference that was hosted by the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities um, at George Fox University in Newburgh, Oregon. Um, so it is something that I care a lot about, and I'm thrilled at the opportunity to talk about these issues um, right here at home. Um, so I want to start with a story, and it happened not quite five years ago. I was about four and a half months into my new role as VP for Student Life here at Calvin. It's probably fair to say that I was in the honeymoon phase. I was not yet fully aware of what the job entailed, not that I am ever going to be fully aware, or the cycles of ups and downs that would come. But I had been here long enough to be tired and ready for a break. And I'm sure that I can get some finger snaps on that one because it's right about that time in the semester. And thankfully, a break was just around the corner. It was the Sunday night before Thanksgiving. And I was home with my family and enjoying the view of a gentle snowfall. And let's be honest that as a Southern California transplant, I was still in the honeymoon phase of the whole snowfall thing too. There we sat in the cozy comfort of our warm living room and the phone rang. There had been a situation on campus. They wanted me to know. It had been reported by a few students who were walking from a parking lot back to their residence halls. And as they were walking, they were shocked to see the image of a swastika and the words white power scrawled in the snow on the windshield of a car they had passed. As they took it all in, they quickly noticed that there were other things scrawled on other cars in the lot. And so they hurriedly rushed to their RA to report what they'd seen. And the students who discovered what came to be new, known on campus as the snow graffiti, as well as the RA they reported it to initially were all students of color. Now, we were only a handful of weeks away from having celebrated one of the largest admit cohorts of students of color in Calvin's history. And as you might have guessed, within minutes of the discovery, the pictures were posted on social media and news of the incident sent shockwaves throughout our community. 
And my oldest daughter was nine years old at the time. And I remember her watching my face as I took the call and was learning more about what had transpired. And after I hung up, she softly asked, what happened, mom? And I, I did that thing that parents do when we, uh, we wanna avoid sharing too much for fear that our kids won't understand or that they'll be overly worried about us and our work. I brushed away her question, but the weightiness of what happened started to really settle on me. And I remember feeling the anxiety rise up. And so I turned back to her and I responded simply, something happened on campus and it's not the way it's supposed to be. See, we were making strides. The composition of the student body was moving in the direction we want it to. We had just oriented new students to help them understand dynamics of difference and power on campus. And in this day and age, members of our campus community ought to be able to traverse campus without encountering messages of hate that threaten their very safety. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. And when I'm really honest, there was more wrapped up in that statement than just my musings on the structural racism that permitted this sort of thing to happen in 2015. There was a part of me that resented that this was happening on my watch, and it immediately brought to the surface all the things that whites feel in situations where we're exposed. Shame, guilt, outrage, judgment, defensiveness, blame. One of the first thoughts that went through my swirling mind was, I'm sure the people who did this didn't intend for it to have this sort of impact. And as I engaged with my young daughter, I had a moment where I felt the familiar enticing draw to emotionally detach from the situation out of self-preservation, except I couldn't this time. And worse, people were actually looking to me as if to say, what now? So what do we do when we find ourselves in situations that seem so impossibly big, so impossibly screwed up, so pervasive and so daunting that they threaten our hope? I'm someone who doesn't appreciate platitudes, really. Trite, meaningless statements that are typically aimed at quelling social, emotional, or cognitive unease. Don't get me wrong, I crave assurance, just like most of us do. I love the idea of easy answers that promise everything is gonna be okay. But deep, pervasive, transformative change doesn't work like that. And if there's anything I've learned from 40 plus years of Sunday school, it's that sanctification is a lifelong journey, as in lifelong and arduous, and forgive me as I channel my seventh grade son for a moment and say, sanctification sucks a lot of the time. It's hard. It's wrought with reminders that there are no shortcuts. And if change is going to happen, something has to die. And deaths aren't easy. Somewhere in the death of the things we're trying to quit or turn away from, we get a glimpse, if not of where we are, then of where we've been. We see in the rearview mirror the depths to which we've sunk, and we wonder if redemption is even possible. Sanctification illuminates what once was hidden in the shadows. It's not a magic line that we cross, but it's a shift. And we tangibly feel what we're walking from darkness toward light. We begin to see the contrast in new ways. And the more we see the light, the more we experience a vision of the way things are supposed to be. And the more we yearn for renewal. That's what the author of Hebrews 11 talks about. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The writer goes on to say, indeed, by faith, our ancestors received approval. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. We talk a lot in higher education about vision, a picture of what's ahead. Vision requires us to see something, to determine where we're going. But faith, faith is seeing the invisible. And in verse 6 of Hebrews 11, the author writes, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith is believing that God is up to something and choosing to walk toward it, even when we can't see clearly the path in front of us. And scripture is replete with stories of people who yearned for something better, who couldn't understand how they were going to get from here to there. And this passage in Hebrews 11 outlines some of those stories. There's Noah who believed God's warning of a flood, even when everyone around him thought he was delusional. Abraham and Sarah who left the security of their homeland when God called them to something new. Joseph, who rose above betray a betrayal and, though he seemingly came from nothing, was elevated to a highly visible, influential leadership role. Moses, who faced significant insecurity and doubt about his qualifications or worthiness, but responded to God's call anyway. Rahab, who courageously assisted the spies, even when it threatened her own well-being. The shepherd boy David, who picked up his measly slingshot and faced the giant. When we read this passage, we catch a picture of the ragtag band of believers that God has used across Christendom to usher in his kingdom. And let's be clear, the backstories of these folks are crammed with dysfunction and deviance. 
Scripture is full of examples of people who messed up, who lost sight of the kingdom vision, and yet God kept bringing them back for something greater. And when I read Hebrews 11, I begin to see the way, or I begin to see that the way forward is made clearer by looking back. We serve a God who redeems our rotten roots and calls us into the light. A large part of my work in higher ed over the years has involved cultivating identity formation in students and leaders. And at the core of what we do as Christian educators, we're working to help our students and our colleagues find identity, to live into the fullness of who they were created to be. And in our Christocentric institutions, we talk about this in the context of the kingdom of God. It's about purpose and calling, about our response to God's invitation to join his kingdom work. Not only the pursuit of who we are, it's also a deepening understanding of whose we are. But the longer I serve in a senior leadership position, the more convicted I become that we're missing the full picture of what identity formation means in our context, because we tend to limit the conversation to individual identity formation. And in doing so, we missed opportunities to think institutionally. At a systems level, our institutions have developed distinct personalities and characteristics by which we are recognized or known. These are our reputations, and institutional identities define an institution to itself and to others. They contribute to how we're known, how we affiliate. And just as traditional undergraduate students in our context tend to have some aha moments about their families of origin once they have some critical distance, there are ways that the culture of Christianity and Christian higher education have shaped our perceptions, behaviors, and frames of reference. As James Baldwin says, history is literally present in all that we do. Individually and institutionally, we best understand the way forward by looking back. Where have we come from? And how is this inextricably linked to who we are and how, how we operate currently? And when we encounter aha moments that aren't all glitter and roses, what then shall we do? My goal this afternoon is not to definitively answer that question for each of you or myself even, it's to complicate the narrative and to catalyze reflection and ultimately active response. And to do that, we have to start with some history to remind us of our roots through the particular lens of Christianity and racism. One of the earliest historical moments that set the stage for inextricably linking whiteness and Christianity was in the seventh century and it stemmed from a racist interpretation of Genesis 9, based in part on an incorrect etymology of the name of Noah's son, Ham. If you remember, Noah cursed the descendants of Ham, his, his son Ham, with servitude. And though it's still a hot topic among historians and biblical scholars, there's evidence that a misreading of Hebrew and other Semitic languages led to a mistaken belief that the word Ham meant black, brown, or dark. And believe it or not, this simple interpretation was then seen as a justification for enslavement. And not only that, it became the backdrop of divine justification for white Christians to defend slavery. It provided supporters of slavery with a way of remaining faithful to the biblical account of a common human origin. They could believe that all human beings are created in the image of God, the very core principle of the abolitionist movement, while also claiming divine authority for the enslavement and subordination of African Blacks and their descendants. Little did they know how consequential this misinterpretation and misapplication of a Bible story, the story of the curse of Ham, would be. Over 300 years, the transatlantic, the transatlantic slave transported more than 10 million Africans to the Americas in a forced migration through the slave trade. In the 15th century, Christian scriptures, Christian theology, cultural practices, and socio-political power all began to merge. The slave trade was viewed as God-ordained dominance, and it contributed to the notion of white ascendancy, which I'll say more about later. Jesus was presented as a dominating white savior. In European America, Christianity became identified with this emerging concept of whiteness, while people of color, including indigenous populations and Africans, began to be identified with unbelief. Theologically conservative Christians insisted that converting individuals to Christianity was the only biblical way to transform society. And this meant that in many contexts, Christians were dissuaded from certain forms of political involvement and were instead encouraged to focus on personal holiness and evangelism. Next came the Civil War, when in the midst of asserting their independence from Britain on the grounds of religious freedom, White evangelicals feared that participating in opposition to slavery 
would detract from that primary work of evangelism, which I just mentioned. As a result, many white Christians perpetuated the age-old practice of invoking the Bible to support and defend economic and political structures that sustained their interest, which in this case was slavery. During Reconstruction, after the Civil War from about 1865 to 1877, the Southern states attempted to rebuild their region. They founded public welfare programs to address social concerns like education and citizens with disabilities and health care. And at first glance, these seem like really noble pursuits, except that in the post-war South, white Christians became concerned that the growing stability and involvement of former slaves threatened their view and vision for Christian America. So in their book, Divided by Faith, Michael Emerson and Christian Smith talk about how these Southern white Christians believed that former slaves were not properly Christianized nor educated. So Southern states focused reconstruction efforts on separating society into two races, and Jim Crow laws were designed and enacted to separate whites from blacks. The 20th century ushered in racial supremacy and the Ku Klux Klan, whose identity had been distinctive, distinctively Christian throughout history. Klan membership surged from 1920 to 1925, when up to 6 million white Americans became members after the film entitled The Birth of a Nation was released. The film conveyed the message that Klan members were valiant defenders of the Southern culture and protectors of the purity of white womanhood. And later, as the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s gained traction, white evangelicals were largely silent about issues of race and injustice. The prevailing sentiment was that efforts to reform race relations were problematic. Social reform was seen as futile because moral decline was inevitable until Christ comes again. The answer was Christian conversion and love, not activism. And to give you a sense of just how pervasive this ideology was, the first race-related article in Christianity Today wasn't written until 1957, and it was written in support of Jim Crow segregation. Now, this sentiment fed the theological view of free will individualism, a belief that all people have the ability to create their individual destiny and are therefore partially responsible for the good or bad in their lives. We see echoes of this today within evangelicalism through the persistent American social belief of meritocracy, which posits that all people have equal opportunities to achieve and receive societal benefits. And the legacy of free will individualism has led to a historical lack of involvement in anti-racism efforts among white evangelical Christians, undergirded by a commonly held belief that individual struggles are a result of the lack of individual effort rather than systemic oppression or inequality due to racism. So in the early 60s and 70s, as public schools were forced to integrate, a multitude of Christian institutions started to spring up. And we'd all like to think that private Christian education led the charge to integrate, but this simply isn't the case in the vast majority of cases. Private, privatization blossomed. The prevalent rationale was that Christian schools were combating secular humanism and liberalism, but make no mistake, the racial landscape was a big part of the story. In the 10 year span between 1961 and 1971, non-Catholic Christian schools doubled their enrollment. And the next decade, they doubled again from 561,000 students to 1.3 million. These schools thrived for decades with predominantly white student bodies and leadership. And journalist Paul Parsons has estimated that people of color constituted less than 3% of the student population in most of these schools as recently as the mid 1980s. So what of Christian higher ed? Where did we come from? Where are we in the midst of all of this? The roots of American higher education can be traced to the founding of the university tradition in Paris and Bologna. From the beginning, early institutions were instruments of the church. And this is evidenced by two key hallmarks that have persisted to this day, the search for truth and the freedom to pr pursue that search. Now, since the beginning, there have always been tensions in the relationship between the church and the university. And many of these stem from conflicts between authority, which is often symbolized in the church, and the freedom to pursue truth, which is often symbolized in the academy. Early American settlers, motivated by a strong missionary spirit, ushered in the Protestant era. And even before they built elementary schools, they formed colleges as a means to build Christian civilization in the New World and preserve their particular form of Christianity. 
but even they were bitterly divided. Harvard was founded to help Puritans escape Anglican Oxford and Cambridge. Yale appeared when a group of New Haven ministers decided to respond to the distrust they felt in the face of the liberal heresies that were dominating Harvard. Yankee Methodists set up Boston University at the time of the Civil War because they felt that Harvard's classical curriculum and aristocratic values were destroying the ethos of pious dissent. These and other examples show the earnestness with which these early institutions sought to preserve Christian civilization. Sadly, in the decades that followed, all of these early colleges founded by Protestant groups subsequently severed their religious ties and foundations. So what was the role of the academy in colonial America? Craig Stephen Wilder in his book, Ebony and Ivory states, the founding, financing, and development of higher education in the colonies were thoroughly intertwined with the economic and social forces that transformed West and Central Africa through the slave trade and devastated indigenous nations in the Americas. Even the name higher education indicates how it was not meant to be a populist form of education, but was instead focused on educating the elite of society. College administrators struggled for the loyalty and patronage of wealthy colonial families, and the survival of colonial schools often depended on their success in tapping into the fortunes of American merchants and plantation owners. College had armed these owners with theories of racial difference and scientific claims about the superiority of white people. So racism permeated even the physical spaces of these early campuses, which were often decorated with Native American bones and artifacts, European nations founded academies to secure their colonial interests, and they supported these schools by exploiting the decline of First Nations and the rise of African slavery. Students and educators turned physical reminders and cultural legacies of violent conflicts and demographic upheavals into objects of tourism and fascination. When the idea of the multiversity burst on the scene in the late 20th century, so not all that long ago, higher education experienced massive transformation. It went from an era when organized Christianity and explicitly Christian ideals had a major role in the leading institutions of higher ed to an era when they had almost none. The multiversity dramatically expanded the curriculum of American higher education, and it provided opportunities for students of all interests and socioeconomic backgrounds. And as the leading private colleges began taking on more characteristics of the German university model, science replaced the classical curriculum and things like the classics and religions were diminished. The multiversity had become a wealthy and powerful partner in the development of modern culture, in part by ignoring its own cultural heritage and embracing secularism, in part by reifying the social hierarchies of the day. The faith-reason dichotomy had been clearly established, but in the midst of this era, substantial numbers of colleges and universities, mostly small, undergraduate, church-affiliated institutions, chose a different explicitly Christian philosophy and mission. In the years following World War II, the Truman Report illuminated glaring oversights and barriers in the system and outlined broad initiatives that eventually led to the transformation of American higher education. And in fact, up until this COVID area, this is probably the, the most known season of change in higher ed's recent history. For the first time in history at that point in time, a United States president, Truman, used federal means to intentionally delve into exploring higher education, which had previously been under the purview of state and local control. The report that Truman commissioned outlined aggressive and wide-spanning recommendations of federal reform that honed in on financial aid and long-term development. Chief among the tenants expressed in the Truman report was the idea of education for all. And the report ushered in significant change in the areas of student access, faculty hiring and retention, teaching and learning, curricular development, and the co-curriculum. The period from 1945 to 1970 is often referred to as American higher education's golden age due to widespread reform and efforts to provide mass access. In the midst of this expansive growth in the golden age, questions emerged about the true depth of faith-based higher education. In, in the midst of this churn, there emerged a group of Christian institutions that aimed to break down this dichotomy between faith and reason. The students of these institutions were drawn to the dual emphasis on academic excellence and religious vitality. And in 1971, evangelical colleges came together to form the Christian College Consortium 
which later became the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities, which Calvin remains a member of today. By 1990, CCCU institutions enrolled almost 130,000 undergraduate students. And in the following decade, enrollments increased by over 30,000 students, so that by the early 2000, even, 2000s, evangelical colleges were the largest and fastest growing Protestant group in higher education. There are currently more than 4,000 degree granting institutions of higher ed in the United States. And of these, 900 identify as religiously affiliated, including the roughly 180 college uh, Christian institutions that comprise the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities today. And what of the earlier trends of schools that were distinctively Christian being distinctively white? Well, based on the results captured in a 2011 study, which traced the overall percentage of students of color at CCCU institutions over a seven year period, despite significant growth in the enrollment of students of color, when compared to the level of diversity at other institutions across the US, CCCU institutions lagged by more than 3%. And while the population of college and university faculty in the United States has experienced significant diversification over the past 40 years, the number of underrepresented faculty continued to increase very slowly within Christian higher education, where it is projected that only a decade ago, in 2009 and 10, less than 6% of tenure track faculty and only 12% of non tenure track faculty at CCCU institutions were faculty of color. As recently as 20 years ago, of the 100 member institutions of CCCU, only 12 had a larger percentage of black students in their student bodies than the national average for black students at the nation's dominantly white institutions. And at that time, there were 41 evangelical colleges where the percentage of black students was less than 3%. 33 colleges where the percentage of black students was less than 2%. And 12 where the percentage of black students was less than 1%. Now, many of us engage in this session to know uh, today know that the vast majority of institutions in the US, whether they're CCCU or non CCCU institutions, continue to struggle when it comes to fostering equitable campus communities to support and sustain diverse student populations. What I've tried to illuminate in this history lesson is that this stems from unjust practices that have existed since the foundations of American higher education, and they've been perpetuated across the academy and the church. Our institutions perpetuate a variety of obstacles for our students, staff, and faculty of color, many of whom experience disenfranchisement and isolation in the midst of institutional cultures where exclusive and discriminatory practices, curricular shortfalls, and limited perspectives on how knowledge is made and known and valued. And similar to the period of time after the Enlightenment, in contemporary America, there's a sense that a radical secular spirit is corrupting cultural I Christian ideals. And as a result, Christian education. Not only has this perpetuated some of the culture wars that we find ourselves navigating today, it's led to some patterns of resistance in Christian higher education, particularly when it comes to anti-racism work within the Christian Academy. In 2017, some Azusa Pacific University colleagues, Allison Ash, Karen Clark, and Alex June, launched a qualitative study exploring the experiences of white administrators in Christian higher education who were active in anti-racism advocacy in their campuses. And what they found was a paradox. In some ways, the personal faith of the administrators or their identity with communities of faith helped, and in other ways, it hindered. So what are the ways that it helped? For many administrators, their Christian faith was the fundamental framework that motivated and guided their anti-racism efforts. They described the synergistic relationship between advocacy and faith in which their faith motivated their pursuit of racial justice and racial justice motivated a deepening of their faith. They also described a shift in mindset which allowed them to move from individual perspectives to communal and systemic perspectives, so thinking outside of their own experience. They talked about shifting from politics to Christian practices and the need to frame issues of racial justice in such a way that working for racial equality and helping to create campus environments that are free from racial discrimination is seen as gospel rather than political. They experienced a shift beyond interest convergence, which transformed the discussion of anti-racism advocacy from one of institutional survival. In other words, we need students of color to increase tuition and remain viable toward a call for justice that reflects the kingdom of God, the way things were intended to be. In each of these ways, their, their faith helped them engage. 
But there were also ways that administrators reported their Christian faith or affiliation with faith communities hindered their anti-racism advocacy. They reported navigating suspicion around certain terms like social justice and what happened when they used certain terminology that increased suspicion that they weren't keeping the core tenets of the Christian faith central in their lives. They reported being frustrated by faith communities that emphasized individual evangelism at the expense of racial justice. So imagine settings where they heard messages like justice is good, but evangelism is better. Or faith traditions that tended to cultivate a culture of individualism that emphasized personal freedom of choice, where oppressive realities were seen as personal choice rather than systemic inequities. They described the disconnect between the Christian community's focus on individual freedoms and the reality of systems of oppression and injustice. They were wearied by some Christians on willingness to sit with different faith perspectives or political views. And in each of these examples, they encountered strong resistance. So how and why are Christians resisting multiculturalism and anti-racism advocacy? Some Christians believe that the pursuit of multiculturalism is more aligned with secular ideals than Christian principles. This is particularly relevant for Christians who view cultural norms as counter to God's ideal and see resistance to culture as critical to faith formation and spiritual growth. For some Christians, a multicultural framework seems to offer preferential treatment to certain individuals and groups, which directly contradicts mainline evangelical Christian cultural values of merit-based achievement and individual work and rewards. Within Christian higher education, this sometimes manifests in a preoccupation with international diversity efforts, such as mission trips and study abroad, and an avoidance of initiatives that focused on domestic diversity. A common reaction is this push-pull dialectic in which Christians are simultaneously pulled toward the need to address ethnocultural and ethno-religious concerns, while at the same time pushed away from fully embracing multiculturalism due to its alignment with secular pluralistic culture. And this has drastic implications for our students, staff, faculty, and institutions. I'd argue that it has drastic implications for the kingdom. How does whiteness in the Christian Academy manifest in our institutions today? How can we better understand the ways that our institutional histories, missions, physical settings, norms, values, traditions, and assumptions guide our behaviors? A cultural analysis is necessary. According to Edgar Schein, considered by many to be the father of organizational culture, Culture is an abstraction, yet the forces that are created in social and organizational situations that derive from culture are powerful. If we don't understand the operation of these forces, we become victim to them. So a popular folktale of racism goes something like this. Individual ignorance and hate leads to racist ideas, which leads to discrimination. But in truth, what's been borne out in history is actually the inverse of that. Racial discrimination leads to racist ideas, which leads to ignorance and hate. And this is the causal relationship driving America's history of race relations. In his book, Stamped from the Beginning, Ibram Kendi uncovers how racially discriminatory policies have usually sprung from economic, political, and cultural self-interests that are constantly changing. We see this in politics, we see this in business, we see this in art and journalism and theology and education. I've come to appreciate the scholarly work of a woman named Diane Lynn Gusa, who developed a framework that thinks, uh, helps us think about white normativity and its impact on higher education. And this framework is called white institutional presence. Gusa asserts that structural privilege is preserved through the practice of whiteness. And white institutional presence is defined as the institutionalized fusion of white worldview, white supremacy, and white privilege. And I am very well aware that these are buzzwords right now. So I wanna unpack them through a scholarly lens and help you understand how GUSA and others have come to understand the implications of these terms and actually these patterns within higher education. So every subpopulation of people is heterogeneous, meaning there isn't one single story for any one group of people. Research has revealed underlying cultural commonalities that exist within groups. And this is particularly true for white culture. The fact is that whiteness is not based on complexion or status. It reflects what one does rather than what one has. Now think of this the ways that this showed up as I recounted history earlier. 
whites decided who was similar and different, as well as how resources were owned and distributed. Whites have been taught to think about racism only as discrete acts committed by individual people, rather than as complex interconnected systems. The truth is, as whites, we don't always perceive privilege because we're typically comparing ourselves to other whites. And when that happens, privilege is often invisible. Even the idea that whiteness is a concept isn't acknowledged. So often, we whites position ourselves as innocent of race because surely racism isn't just a white problem. Defensiveness, denial, and resistance run deep. And because of this, there's often a white expectation in our institutions that people of color should teach us about racism. This is particularly insidious because it implies that racism is something that happens to people of color and has nothing to do with us, thus we can't be expected to have knowledge of it. Now, there are four attributes of white institutional presence that Gusa talks about. And the first is known as white ascendancy. Gusa describes this as the thinking and behaviors that arise from white mainstream authority and advantage, which in turn are generated from whiteness's historical position of power and domination. Just as it's been throughout history, whites continue to benefit from the accrual of material and social advantage. So think about the context of our institutions. What are the, are the racial and ethnic demographics of the people on our campuses who receive the highest merit scholarships? who occupy leadership positions on faculty senate or other governing boards, who sit on cabinet or in other leadership positions, who decide who's hired to teach or support students, who pick the curriculum, who write the curriculum, who choose the worship style or sermon topics, who craft campus-wide announcements or teach or counsel, advise and coach and on and on. It shows up in the form of superiority as well. The belief that my ideas, my knowledge, my values, my norms, and my understanding of history are universally and exclusively correct. When outrageous incidents like vandalism or racial slurs occur, it's relatively easy to get people to express outrage against these explicit acts of prejudice. But it's not nearly as easy to get people to care about long-term issues like recruiting or retaining faculty of color and the scarcity of staff working on diversity issues. Racism is easier when we can trace it to deviant individuals, but problems with enrollment and climate and access, these are much harder for us. White ascendancy also involves entitlement and domination, a sense of ownership over a place, classroom discussion time, great expectation, faculty support. And this is why we often see patterns where white students question diversity requirements, but they don't question math or science or history requirements. You see, we're insulated from racial stress at the same time that we come to feel entitled and deserving of our advantage. And when do we feel racial stress? When we feel personally attacked as a result of discussions of racism. White victimization happens when the progress of people, people of color somehow feels like loss to whites. And this victimization is embedded in what Robin D'Angelo calls white fragility. White people are often receptive to feedback on how unintentional racism is manifesting, so long as it remains abstract. When it becomes personal or a dynamic is pointed out in the moment, it's typical for whites to become defensive, explain what they, that they were misunderstood, and then angrily withdraw, while others, others run in to defend by re-explaining what was really meant or what was really intended. So often, we whites prefer racial segregation because if we can maintain white solidarity, then we save face, we look good. We get defensive at any hint or suggestion that we may be connected to racism. And the ensuing guilt paralyzes us so much that we become ineffective. In this way, guilt functions as an excuse for inaction. And though this shows up in all kinds of ways. When we assume that everyone is having or can have our experience, when we demonstrate a lack of racial humility or an unwillingness to listen, when we dismiss what we don't understand, when we wanna jump over the hard personal work to rush to solutions, when we confuse disagreement with not understanding, when we focus on our intentions over our impacts. In the words of Robin D'Angelo, quote, stopping our racist patterns must be more important than working to convince others that we don't have them, unquote. And let's not forget microaggressions, those subtle, slight comments or behaviors that remind people of color of their marginalization. On an individual basis, these slights are annoying and they're worthy of eye rolls. But on a, on a cumulative basis, they contribute to a sense of alienation and debilitating emotional fatigue. 
students of color on our campus experience isolation and loneliness in all sorts of ways. When they're left out of informal study groups, when they have limited knowledge of how to navigate institutional systems and policies, when they're constantly being asked to justify or represent the generalized experience of people from their particular ethnic, racial, or religious, or gender groups. And similarly, faculty and staff of color who leave rarely be leave because of dramatic incidents. It's typically the day-to-day -day strain of being reminded that they're somehow unwelcome and that their voices are not valued. It's death by a million paper cuts. Or as one student of color put it, quote, whites are often able to accept blacks as people, but not as black people, unquote. Monoculturalism is another manifestation of white normativity. White values tend to emphasize things like separateness and uniqueness and survival of the fittest, which places the onus of learning solely on the individual student and considers the weeding out of individuals as an important rite of passage. Monocultural values are embedded in the built environment of our institutions as well. As students walk through the halls of campus, what pictures, statues, texts, and building names do they see? What about concerts and musicians and activities and student government initiatives? How do the physical structures, their aesthetics, the spaces and programming on our campuses either promote or inhibit a sense of belonging for our students, staff, and faculty of color? What scholarly worldview do our institutions value? How do we identify what knowledge is, how to assess it, what value it has, and who possesses it? In the 1960s, the progressive aspiration of colorblindness was an encouragement in the midst of the ab abolishment of the color-coded laws of Southern apartheid. I mentioned Jim Crow earlier. Today, it's evolved and has come to mean that the race of a person is and ought to be immaterial. The words shared by Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as he dreamed that his son might, quote, one day be judged by the content of his character and not the color of his skin, unquote, were appropriated and seem to provide a simple and immediate solution to racial tensions. Simply pretend that we don't see race and racism will end. White blindness contends that everyone is the same. So race becomes an illegitimate subject for conversations and policy discourse. It reifies social hierarchies and maintains the status quo. Inequity persists when we subscribe to the pervasive ideology that noticing difference is somehow problematic and it may lead to prejudiced thought or discriminatory behavior. Colorblindness espouses an egalitarian approach to human actions, but it often leads to increased social distance when whites exercise extreme caution in social situations as a means of avoiding conflict. In our institutions, this is apparent in curricular decisions when faculty decide on texts without a critical eye for deficit or racialized messages embedded in those texts. It's apparent in policy decision making when white racial behavior is not considered, for example, within institutional diversity plans. The discourse tends to focus on students of color and their exposure to harassment and discrimination and how institutions can develop strategies to help them feel safe. And little attention is paid to the actual source of the climate. All of us have been implicitly or explicitly socialized to the idea that race is something we cannot talk about. A colorblind perspective is well-intentioned but it does not equip us to respond to today's realities. When people feel that they can't talk about race, how can they explain or understand concepts like the fact that 90% of American Protestant churches are racially homogenous? How do they explain the racial profiling phenomenon of driving while black or flying while brown? How do they explain the underrepresentation of Asian Americans in leadership and management positions? Learning is dependent upon mutually constructive meaning and it has to be situated in learners' own experiences. White blindness allows well-meaning white people to maintain a positive, I'm not racist self-image while still perpetuating racism. And this is called aversive racism. And it's enacted when we rationalize that racial segregation is unfortunate but necessary to ensure that our kids can access a good education. When we assert that our workplaces are virtually all white because people of color just don't apply. When we rationalize that we ought to avoid direct racial language and instead use coded terms like urban or underprivileged or sketchy. When we deny the fact that we have few cross-cultural relationships with our, within our institutions by proclaiming how far we've come and lauding our diversity. And finally, white normativity is revealed through something called white estrangement. 
This manifests through the physical and social distancing of whites from people of color. One thing we know as educators is that compositional diversity is important, but it isn't enough. There are patterns of social racial isolation of whites from people of color in our country that produce and reinforce both cultural ignorance and interpersonal awkwardness. And it typically stems from experiences in neighborhoods, elementary, secondary schools, and on college campuses. As 18 to 22 year old white students come into more diverse college environments, they often lack the understandings and tools to navigate multicultural environments. And this can lead to reliance on stereotypes, racial ignorance, tension, and avoidance of those who are different. For most of our adolescent lives, whites are able to exist without having to consider our racial backgrounds. And college is a period that often represents the first time in many of our lives that white students have meaningful interactions across race. I know this was certainly true for me when I came to Calvin. And being insulated from the pain of racism frequently leads white students to make some logical leaps. I don't see racism in my everyday life, therefore there must not be racism, except maybe by some fringe groups like the KKK. And we whites are often afraid of our own ignorance. We're afraid that we'll ask a naive question or make an offensive remark that will provoke, provoke the wrath of people of color. And as a result, we often settle for fear-induced silence. Or we can become so divorced from empirical reality that we sincerely believe that people are out to get us. Joe Fagan and Eileen O'Brien call these sincere fictions. These frequent, they frequently come up in the context of conversations around reverse discrimination. White people fear negative reactions with people of color, but when pressed, they tend to have little basis for their racial fear. So a white student may talk about how they have a strong feeling that they are true targets of modern day discrimination, sometimes called ra reverse racism, but they can't point to strong evidence of this. We whites often fail to see our social isolation and segregation as something racial, and we label it natural or unintentional. The tendency in many Christian circles is to highlight personal morality while downplaying social justice. In fact, as I referenced earlier, even the, the term social justice can be inflammatory. Many Christians are more comfortable with the word justice and are wary of participating in the work of social justice because of a deep rooted fear of being labeled liberal, progressive, or secular. So what of this social aspect of biblical justice? What are we to do? If Christ is truly Lord over every aspect of our lives, then clearly this must also include the social realm. Often Christians mistakenly remove the cultural context from Jesus' ministry, and we're sometimes prone to water down gospel message to one of platitudes. But Jesus is more complex than we often give him credit for. And when we spend time in the New Testament scriptures reflecting on his life and ministry, we see that he intentionally, purposely, and passionately addressed very specific social issues and causes. In fact, he was radical in his approach, shattering status quo and addressing the diverse and complicated conflicts of the time. He embraced the strange. And he wasn't just espousing a perspective with his words. He was modeling active engagement with specific social, economic, and even political issues of the time. He was present and involved with those who were being abused, violated, and oppressed. And this means that social justice has its biblical roots in a triune God who time and time again shows his love and compassion for the weak, the vulnerable, the marginalized, the disenfranchised, and the disinherited. As Christian leaders, it's not enough for me to simply recognize system, systemic oppression. Love compels us to act. And this means addressing the complex realities within our institutions and communities that create such problems and avoiding the temptation to rely on generic excuses and solutions. God is making all things new and he invites us to partner in this kingdom work. Now we've been confronted with a number of questions and ideas today and all of them beg a larger question. How am I to respond? What does it mean to be an agent of renewal in this particular moment, in this particular institution, in this particular season? What does it mean to accept God's invitation to actively participate in this redeeming work right here, right now? What is my role in bringing about God's vision for Shalom? In his 2019 book, The Color of Compromise, Jamar Tisby charges us with these words. We must learn to discern the difference between complicit Christianity and courageous Christianity. Christian higher education has a paradoxical relationship with institutional racism. We are simultaneously in a position of both reproducing white privilege and creating arenas to challenge racism. 
But rather than despair, I pray that we can see the opportunity in this. Wherever systemic racism is present, neutrality is not an option. As Howard Zinn says, you can't be neutral on a moving train. As leaders, we have to ask ourselves if we want to be part of the solution or part of the problem. And I define leadership broadly, not only as positionality, but also as influence, which means each of us has an opportunity to lead. I want to close our time together this afternoon with some practical suggestions to inspire us toward action. And I like the way that um, institutional change scholar Adriana Kazar thinks about three distinct layers of analysis and action that are necessary as we pursue strategic and transformative change as leaders and influencers in our culture. First, there's the organizational or structural layer, which provides framing and directions. It helps prioritize change initiatives, communicate vision, and energize campus constituents. There's also the behavioral layer, which is a little more personal, and it can foster momentum, create opportunities for involvement, and entrench systemic su support. And finally, there's the cultural layer, which helps us focus on the meaning of change, to work to build consensus around shared values, to navigate through work and, and work to resolve conflicts, and to embed changes in the culture. So first, the structural layer depends on the avoidance of white supremacy. So here are some things we can do about it. We can learn to understand how making excuses for or ignoring the racism of certain heroes of the Christian faith can impact historically marginalized communities on our campuses. We can work not only to we can work not to allow political ideology to be a mark of institutional or Christian identity. We can recognize the detrimental impact of organizational colorblindness. In our classes and trainings, we can read and require black and brown authors. We can intentionally hire people of color to fill positions other than ethnic specific positions. And we can call out microaggressions in public ways through our voices and platforms of influence. On the structural organizational side, we also need to model repentance and reparation. Under Old Testament law, if a person wronged another person, the wrongdoer was to confess the sin, but I'm sorry wasn't enough. Biblical justice requires that what was damaged must be restored. So again, I ask, what then shall we do? We can take down statues and symbols from public spaces that promote white supremacy or preserve racist words, actions, or legacies. And let's not just get rid of them. As Alec Jun and his colleagues assert, let's put them in places where we can collectively lament our shared past and learn about the racism that was once on display, but is now so commonly hidden within our hearts and unconscious minds. We can attend to the needs of historically marginalized and underrepresented groups on our campuses. We can increase access to education, tuition, and expenses. We can invest in our local public schools. We can look to the Black church and other ethnic traditions to learn how to both lament and rejoice. How do we value theologies other than white theology in worship and on campus studies and the talks we give and who's given a platform or a pulpit? And what are we missing when we don't value these other voices and theologies? When it comes to the behavioral layer, we need to do our own work. We should seek out information from books, websites, films, podcasts, and other available sources, particularly those created by people of color. We should diversify our social media feeds by following voices from racial, ethnic, and political backgrounds that are different from our own. We should advocate approaches that give all students exposure to curricula and knowledge sources that center voices other than whites, and these voices should be integrated into general education and not just elective courses. We can get involved with multiracial organizations and white organizations working for justice. We can build authentic cross-racial cross relationships and be willing to watch, listen, and learn rather than dominate in these relationships. And on the cultural side, we need to understand how white institutional presence impacts our campuses. One way to do this is to complete a cultural audit that focuses on compositional elements, so examining representation on campus, programmatic elements like diversity-related initiatives, workshops, and courses, and social elements, how community members socialize across boundaries and issues. This could entail completing focus group interviews to understand how students of color experience and engage in classrooms, reviewing campus documents to determine what cultures are advocated for in our written artifacts, adding campus climate questions on course evaluations and as part of regular institutional assessment cycles, focusing on the disciplines or offices where engagement of historically underrepresented racial and ethnic groups is low, 
and collecting data to identify challenges and share critical assessment data within those disciplines and across campus. And finally, we need to cultivate brave spaces on our campuses. This applies to all learning spaces, whether inside or outside the classroom. Brave spaces flourish when we flourish when we openly discuss opposing ideas with civility, when we both own intentions and impacts, when we challenge by choice and avoid the tendency to retreat, when we show respect for the basic personhood of others, and when we agree not to intentionally inflict harm on another soul. At Calvin, this is woven into our philosophy of freedom of expression and civil discourse. So whew, I've covered a lot of ground. But do you hear the words of Hebrews 11 echoing? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. What is seen was made by things that are not visible. I need to trust the validity of others' experiences, to work to pay attention to the invisible. That's what faith is, seeing the invisible and taking steps toward it. Salvadoran Archbishop Oscar Romero spoke out against poverty, poverty, social injustice, assassinations, and torture amid a growing war between left-wing and right-wing forces. And before he was killed by the very violence he stood against, he shared these words. It helps now and then to step back and take the long view. The kingdom of God is not only beyond our efforts, it is even beyond our vision. We cannot do everything, and there is a sense of liberation in realizing that. This enables us to do something and to do it very well. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are workers, not master builders, ministers, not messiahs. We are prophets of a future, not our own. I love that. We are prophets of a future, not our own. May we, Kelvin community members, tell the truth about the past and respond with courage and conviction, taking steps toward the invisible as we defiantly move from hopeless resignation toward urgent renewal. Thanks for joining today. Sarah, I want to say thank you so much for this presentation. I am glad that this presentation was recorded because I know I will want to watch it um, several times over, and I know that there are others who will want to watch this again. Um, this is a timely message, and this is something for us to think about. Um, where are we as an institution, and where do we want to be as an institution, and how does whiteness show up um, in our institution? So thank you for the challenge. Thank you for the practical steps that we can take to address whiteness. Um, and thank you for the challenge of creating brave spaces so that we can all bring our full selves to the conversation so that we will live into the promise of the kingdom um, as you refer to and as we hope for. So thank you again so very much. Um, for our guests who have joined us, we wanna thank you for being a part of day three of the teach-in on race, racism and anti-racism. In the um, chat, you will see um, a link to the um, discussion that will take place in just a few minutes. You'll have to give us a couple of minutes of transition, um, but we invite you there to continue the conversation. Um, and this session has been recorded, as I said, and so we just look forward to it. Please join us again tomorrow at four o'clock p.m same place, um, and we will um, continue this conversation on race, racism, and anti-racism. Thank you again. I'm Michelle Lloyd-Page, and it's been a pleasure to have you with us. Bye now. <laughs>